between the two of us. You are on. Can I go ahead and start without that? We're looking at a new lesson today called A Name Like No Other. A new unit. Several lessons in this unit. Uh, we're talking about the name of God. And we're looking at that. And uh, as we look at the name is like no other name, uh, as we study these lessons, we'll learn some things about God, hopefully, and just reinforce what we already know about God and about his name and how, how uh, where as one hymn, I looked up in the hymn book, it's what I'm not familiar with called... Um, uh, well, it's, it's higher. It's a holy ground. It's not holy ground we only know, but it says, uh, and where he is, is holy. Wherever God is, everything is holy. And so as we look at God, we look at the holiness of God and how he, it, uh, how that affects us as his children. Uh, the title of our lesson today is The Importance of God's Name. As we look at God's name, and we know in the Old Testament, as we read uh, we've had uh, Tim has given us many sermons on the names of God. You know, if you go out through the Old Testament, uh, there are a lot of names: uh, Jehovah Jireh, uh, Jehovah Rini. There are just all kinds of names about God. The things God does or did for His people in the Old Testament, He does for us. So there's a, a lot in there. And if you think about names, you know, uh, most people, most businesses like to have a good name, don't they? When you see an advertisement on TV. They don't tell you the bad things about the company. They tell you all the good things. So they want a good impression of the name. Like, can you think of some names like Nike or Coca-Cola or some of those kind of things? Certain things you think of. Uh, certain TVs, certain kind of TVs. LGs and one of some of the others these days. I didn't know the other day LG stands for life is good. Life's good. That's what that stands for. So, so they want some kind of name and, uh, that's, that brings out their, their, their item, whatever it is. And um, so these names are really important. Now, you, how many of you ever watched Waters World? You ever seen Waters World? You remember Waters used to do Waters World when he was on uh, what, Bill O'Reilly? And he was the one going out and doing the, the interviewing. And uh, when he goes to New York, now I'm asking you, now, he, he, forget what you know about the Bible. Forget for a second. But if you were on the streets of New York City and Johnny comes out and he puts that mic in your, set, your face and he says, give me one word that describes God to you. What would they say? Not what we would say. What would they say? There is no God. Who is he? <laughs> what? Who is that? Who is he? And it's probably something about. Also, uh, he's a he's a Santa Claus. If, if, you know, or even if they know God, they probably say, "Who is God?" You know. But now we think of words. Uh, we might say, "God is love, light, beauty." What does him tell us God is? Holy. Holy. The attribute he said is most important is God's holiness. So as we look at God today, we'll see how his, he is holy and look at the holiness of God. So Tim's taught us that well in sermons he's given us. As we look at the scripture today, it's in Exodus. We're starting in Exodus in these lessons, and we're going to go from Exodus to Psalms to uh, Jeremiah to Isaiah, I think, and then to Romans. And in the Psalms again, so we're going to be all through the Bible with these, these uh, the name of God and, and, and how looking at God. But today we start in Exodus. And of course, you know, Exodus uh, involves Moses. And so we're picking up there. And uh, in Exodus, Moses had, had gone from being a privileged, in a privileged position. He was a prince. The, the princess in uh, Egypt had seen him in that, you know, his mother had put him in that little. A uh, little uh, basket in the water, and she found him, and she adopted him, and so he grew up as a prince. So he had he was a prince in Egypt, and he went from that to shepherding sheep for his father-in-law Jethro in Midian. And so he had gone all the way from being a being a prince to a shepherd. And if you know the Egyptians, they thought shepherds were on their bottom. Shepherds, they, they thought shepherds, shepherds were that nobody lifestyle. They thought shepherds were of the lowest class. So he went from the highest class to the lowest class. And so uh, as we look at him and see he's gone now, he's been in exile uh, because he had to flee, because he killed a man, uh, uh, an Egyptian. But uh, in the end of chapter 2, we find that uh, in chapter 2, it says that, uh, that the people... Pharaoh gave, uh, let's, let me chapter two, that's 
God heard the groaning of his people and remembered the covenant he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's the end of chapter 2. And so God heard the groanings of his people. And so now in chapter 3, we're going to see how God's going to help his people, how he's going to get his people out of Egypt. And the point of our lesson today is that God's name reveals he is the all-powerful God whom we can completely trust. So and we begin in chapter 3 uh, with Exodus. Now we know in chapter 1, uh, we read in Exodus that uh, Moses was found in that, in that basket. He was taken and he was raised and he killed the slave and he, and he escaped. He, ran, he fled Egypt for his own safety, his own uh, life. And so in chapter 3, he's faced now out there in that desert area, mountainous area. Uh, uh, he's out there and he's facing uh, just the nature he's around him. And so if we think about the book of Genesis, it ends with, remember Joseph was the end of the book of Genesis. Joseph had saved his people and the Egyptian people from famine because he, God gave him a vision to store up their grain for seven years because there were going to be seven years of famine. And so, you know, you hear a story about Joseph's brothers, how the brothers uh, came in and they tricked Joseph and how they sold him into slavery and all those kind of things. But Joseph ended up being a very important person in the Egyptian power system. He was next to the Pharaoh. And so uh, when Joseph died, though, at the end of Joseph's death, in chapter 2 of Genesis, in chapter 6 of Genesis, he said, what you meant for evil or you planned for evil, God planned for good. So when Joseph ended, uh, or Genesis ended, Joseph was, we was well respected by the Egyptians. He was thought of as a well, uh, one of them. But uh, so everything was going well for the Egyptians. That, I mean, for the, for the Israelites in Egypt. Everything was going well. And now, with Exodus, though, we find out that the Egyptians have turned into making the Israelites slaves because it's been many years now since Joseph died. The Pharaohs have died that knew Joseph. All those people who knew about their history have passed away. And so now the people, the children of Israel kept growing and growing and growing in population. That's what God had promised Abraham. You're, you're, you will not be able to number the number of your descendants. So they kept growing, and so the new pharaoh just thought, well, these, these Israelites might turn against us if our enemies come towards us. They might join the enemy and conquer us. So the pharaohs got worried about the fact that the, the Israelites might somehow could take over and conquer them. So they began to be, he, he put out, the pharaoh put out a decree that he's going to make it hard on the Egyptians, make their work harder, make them have to work more and instead of supplying the bricks for them, they got to supply their own bricks, make their own bricks. So he was planning to really make it hard for the Israelites to live, just to exist. So they wouldn't have time to think about how we could overcome this government. And so uh, that's where they are. That's where the children of Israel are. And so God has, uh, you know, at right now, Mo uh, Moses is in exile. You know, and I thought, you know, so many times we put ourselves in exile too, don't we, with God. So many times in life, we are separated from God because of something that might happen in our life. And, uh, you know, but God always uses those times. When we think, we might think, well, God doesn't know anything about me right now. God doesn't care about me. God always knows he always cares. But we might think, well, I'm, I feel like I'm in a desert. I feel like I'm lost. I'm all by myself. But all that time, like in Moses' life, God was using that time to prepare him. He needed to know what it was like to live in the desert. He needed to know what it was like to... To, uh, to maybe to shepherd sheep out there. But he needed, he learned a lot of things. He had grown up in the palace, had no experience among the, the children of Israel, but he needed this experience. So during this time of exile, God was using this time to prepare Moses to be the leader of his people. A time, you know, it could be a time when we're very spiritual. I don't know if you've ever gone through a period like that or not in your life, but I have. I've been times in my life where I haven't felt close to God. You feel like, you know, you know God, you believe God, you love God, but you just feel a distance between you and Him. It might be because of sickness. It might be because of death. It might be because of financial difficulty. You might say, God, you're not listening to me. You're not hearing my prayer. And you feel distant from Him. And so, you know, we all have those times, either physically or spiritually, where we feel separated in a, a barren land from God. But just as God was working with Moses, He continues to work with us too. And so, even though he was out there uh, shepherding the sheep uh, for 
Jeff, for Jethro, his father-in-law, uh, he wasn't even, these weren't even known sheep. You know, he'd gone from being a prince to shepherding somebody else's sheep. These weren't even his sheep. But he was shepherding those sheep, and uh, he was, and Jethro was not an Israelite either. He was from Gideon, but he was not an Israelite. And the end of the verse, as we look at today, it gives us that God saw, saw the groanings of his people, and he saw Moses out there shepherding the sheep, and he was on God's promised mountain. He was on God's mountain. So that was a sign that God had something in store for these people. That Mount, Mount Horeb, it's called here in some translations, they call it Mount Sinai. It's the same mountain that where the people are, uh, where God uh, gave Moses those Ten Commandments. So uh, here, that's where Moses is serving now. He is out there shepherding sheep near Mount Sinai. So he's going to be very familiar with that area when it's time for him to lead the people out of Egypt. And so we begin to see a little bit of hope as it grows. When we get to verse 2 in the scriptures, we look at it uh, in Moses' account here in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will not turn aside. I see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned, able, turned aside to see, God called to him out in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put, all thy shoes, put off thy shoes from off this thy feet, for the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of the Father, God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon God. You know, it, when he says Moses, Moses, you know, sometimes when we say, when we might call our child's name or somebody's name twice, we might have mean business, you know. But it says when God says Moses, Moses, that was a sign of endearment. They, in, that, in their culture, that was a sign of endearment to call somebody his name twice. Moses, Moses, I want to talk to you. you know, you know, so it was a sign that he had something to say to Moses. So, uh, you know, an angel of the Lord appeared to Moses, it seems, and he said that the angel of the Lord, if you go back and think about it, the angel of the Lord appeared in Genesis several times, didn't it? First it appeared to uh, Hagar and Ishmael. Uh, and it appeared, well not first, but it appeared to them, you know, when they were, when they were sent away into the desert. And then it appeared to Adam, uh, to Abraham and Sarah, when they were without a child, and he said, God said, you're going to have a child. And then the angel appeared to Moses when he was about, when, I mean, when Abraham was about to kill Isaac. <laughs> the angel stopped him and said, now I know, I know you trust me, so you know, I believe in me. So we know that the angel appeared in Genesis several times throughout that book as uh, God was uh, inter interfacing with his people, uh, with Abraham. In each case, the angel provided hope where situations seemed hopeless. Every time the angel came, it was a situation that was a, had a dire need. I mean, Moses and Abraham was about to slay his own son. Was that not a dire need? Was that not a time when God needed to appear? And so the Lord uh, here, same situation seems to be hopeless here. The people in, Israel, in Egypt, the Israelites in Egypt, feel hopeless. They feel like they are doomed to be under the, slave, the slavery of uh, this Egyptian nation. And so the Lord... Uh, came again in a hopeful situation. He did not speak to Moses, but he appeared as a flame and a fire that was not consuming the bush. Uh, you know, we like the Israelites need to take note that the presence of an angel of the Lord is a sign of hopeless. Every time there is an angel, it's a sign of hopefulness. Just like in the birth of Jesus. The angels appeared that night in the de in, to the shepherds. It's a sign of hopefulness. Something good is coming your way. And so in verse 3 it says sometimes God uses drastic circumstances to get our attention. You know, uh, oftentimes if things happen in our lives, if we're not paying attention to God, he's going to do something to get our attention. He's going to wake us up somehow or other. So as uh, same thing was happening here. God had this with drastic circumstances, so God needed to do something drastic to get their attention. And that's what he did for Moses here in verse 3. Uh, first of all, Moses did not recognize the angel as an act of God. Because he was curious, he just approached that bush and he said, God's appearance in the burning bush was a demonstration of his power. God was showing his power to Moses now. You come towards this bush, it was endless power. 
Uh, Moses would need this kind of power to go after it, to do what God was going to call him to do. Moses would have got to need God's power, God's endless power, to take him back to Egypt and lead the other people out of Egypt. So, in verse 4, the Lord spoke to Moses from the burning bush, and he said, The Lord, the creator of the universe and everything in it, knew Moses intimately. He knew the man's name. He knew Moses, and he called him by name. And he knew, already knew everything about Moses. Moses didn't have to tell him anything. And you know, you think about that for us too. God knows us. He knows each of us. He knows our names. He knows everything about us. And so by knowing us, we, we should feel a reverence towards God. And that's what here it was with Moses, an awe. He was so awed by God. He had to hide his face. And so uh, God knew him. God called him by name. And God does not forget. God does not forget your name or my name or anyone's name that comes to him. Uh, he does not get tired like we do. Sometimes we get tired. We get worn out. But God never gets tired. Uh, uh, we have not been forgotten by God, uh, just like Moses had not been forgotten. And Moses' response to God was, here am I. Moses said, Moses, Moses. God said, Moses, Moses. He said, here am I. And so uh, in verse 5, the Lord responded to Moses and warned him not to come closer to the burning bush. Why? He said, because the place where upon you stand, thou standest is holy ground. It's not that place is holy. It is the presence of God that makes the holy place. We, you know one of the familiar songs we have, we are standing in his presence on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy ground. So wherever he is, his presence is holy. And in verse 6, uh, it says, The Lord continued to speak to Moses, and Moses responded with the only appropriate way, with reverential fear. He was fearful. In awe, reverence, he was showing God. And so he briefly there <coughs> was confronting uh, a perfectly righteous man, righteous God, was confronting him, a man with sin and flaws like you and I have. We all have sin and flaws in our life. And uh, I'm sure this con confrontation for Moses was a shocking thing that happened to him. He wasn't expecting to run into God out there in that desert. But God was, God was there to use him. And, uh, and while... Uh, we get our perfect healing in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. God gave the hint of his graciousness uh, when he said to Moses that he was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Uh, God, he was the God of the Israelites from the beginning, for Abraham, and he's God now. We can see that those relationships were most clearly marked by the reality of God's grace towards sinners. One of the best ways to step into unknown preferred future is to remember the ways God has been gracious to us in the past. So many times we have hindsight, don't we? I, I have a lot of hindsight. So many times I think, well, where was God when I needed him? I, had, I was struggling through this time, and I don't know where God was. But as I look back upon it, I know God led me through that whole thing. God was there, he was guiding me, and he was with me, and he gave me whatever strength I needed to get through it. So God is always there. He, he remembers, and he knows, us, uh, from, he knows us where we are. Uh, one of the best ways to step into a known future is to remember the way God is God. God has been with us. Seeing God's past, faithfulness strengthens in our faith, and he will continue to be gracious to us in the future. The more we know about him, take notes what he's done in the past, the better we can trust him in the future. Uh, I remember reading in Graham Lott's book somewhere, and I don't know which one it was, maybe it's all I read recently on a magazine, but she said, um, probably 25, 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago now, she said, I knew God, I knew about God, I knew God, but I really didn't know him well, I wanted to know him. So she said, I made an effort to start then to really get to know God. And if you've ever heard Anne Graham Lott speak, you know she knows God now. And uh, so she said, I, I don't know him perfectly, but I know now better than I knew him 40, 30, 40 years ago. And so that's the way it is. The longer we spend time with God, the more we understand and the more we can depend on him and know him and know he loves us and cares for us. So then in verses 9, 9 through 12, uh, it says, And now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send them unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto the Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, 
And this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. This mountain right here where you are right now, Moses, that's where you're going to be. In verses 7 and 8 that we don't have, uh, God declared that he had heard the cries of the people again, and that he knew about their suffering, and that he heard he had come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians, as he said here in verse, in, in same thing in verse 9. And when it seems like God is silent in our times of trials and suffering, he is never unaware of what we're going through. He's always aware, and he's always concerned about what's going on. God repeated in verse 9 that he knew that it was happening, what was happening in the people of Egypt. From the beginning of Genesis 1 to the salvation of Noah in Genesis 6, to the call of Abraham and the Ur of the Chaldees in Genesis 12, God's plan for his people was that they would live under the power and plan under, the author under his authority. God's plan for his people today is that they live as a people called out from the power of the world to live under his rule and reign. Same thing for us. He's calling us out to be different from the rest of the world. Don't live like the rest of the world. Don't act like the rest of the world. Come out from among them and live under my rule and my reign. We should not be ruled by sin in our culture. And so many times, culture seems to rule everything today, doesn't it? Everything is involved around culture. What does culture say? But the word, but by the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. That's how we should be ruled. What, what God says in his word. Um, in verse 10, God appointed Moses to be his representative before Pharaoh. You've got to go, Moses. You've got to go to that ruler of Egypt. He was appointed to confront the evil power with the words God would give him to say. Moses was not only appointed to act as a prophet against the evil, oppressive Egyptians, but he would also lead the people of Israel during their exodus, just as Jesus would lead his people out of the slavery of sin. Uh, and so the last thing Moses expected or wanted was to be sent by, back to Egypt. You know, he left Egypt because he was afraid for his life, and you know he would never want to go back to Egypt, but because it would be a very dangerous thing for him to do. When God calls us to his service, it rarely involves something easy. God calls us, it's probably going to be hard. And it's probably going to take a lot of effort on our part with his power to get through what he calls us to do. God has appointed leaders to guide us in our journey out of sin. We should encourage them, support them, and hold them accountable to lead us in a way that is honoring to God and in step with his word and his spirit. Even sometime when the word offends. And it does offend occasionally, doesn't it, when people hear God's word. But we have a pastor here that leads us and directs us and is a man of God. And we are so thankful to have him. Uh, as our leader. Moses was 80 years old by this time. You know, when I read that, I thought, oh. Every time I read that, I think, well, I'm about ready to give up. I think, I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit old to do this. I'm going to let somebody else do it. There's somebody younger that ought to be able to do what, I have, what, I, what I'm doing. And then I see this thing, well, Moses was 80 years old. He's still working. He's still doing what God's called him to do. Uh, Jacob, I uh, mean, Joshua and Caleb. How old was Caleb? 80 years old. Well, you know, I keep thinking, well, wouldn't we hang it up? Wouldn't God say, you can, you can retire now? Uh, there's no such thing as in God's kingdom. You can't retire. I, we might say, well, I, I, I'm done. I've already done my thing. You know, I had children. I've already done my thing in the nursery. I've done my thing here. I've done my thing there. God doesn't care. You're still in his kingdom. You still have a responsibility to serve him. Uh, you know, I think the other day, uh, I was thinking about uh, John Kennedy's little speech. You know, his birthday, I mean, his death, he was killed on November the 22nd, I believe 1964. I believe it was the death of his 63 or 64. 63, I, think. I, I was at Winter when it happened. I can't remember what year it was. But anyway, you know, he said his speech, his famous speech was, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And I thought, well, ask not what God can do for you. Ask what you can do for God. Isn't that it? We're part of God's kingdom. What, God, what do you want me to do? What can I do for you, God? You call me to this life. You call me to be in your kingdom. Now, what do you want me to do? How are you leading me? And, you know, so many times I'm, I'm turning the other way. I'm ready, I'm ready to call this sick. I'm ready to go home. But God calls each of us and he says, you can't stop serving me as long as there's breath in your body. As long as you can breathe. You can, you can share the gospel with somebody, and you can live for me. So Moses tells him, can't, we don't have an excuse. You can't say, well, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too ugly. None of those things work for God. We all have to do what he calls us to do. Uh, 
So in verse 11, he told God that he did not think he was up to the job. He said, I don't think I can do this, God. You're calling me to go back to Egypt. I don't think I can do this. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Oh, you know, you got this wrong. You're asking the wrong person here. But just as God told Esther, just as uh, Mordecai told Esther in the book of Esther, he said she was called to be queen for such a time as this. Well, God called Moses for such a time as this. And the same thing goes for us. He calls us for such a time as this. We live in this world today. We live in this culture. And he's calling us to do what he wants us to do in this, in this culture today. And so, you know, maybe Moses was just being humble. Oh, Lord, I, I can't do that. And, hum and being humble is, uh, that's a proper response to God. Because we, none of us are capable. None of us are capable on our own to do what God calls us to do. But there should always be a sense that even though we're insufficient, we can't do it. God has a command on us, and through God, he can help us do it. Uh, and we are to be holy and perfect as he is holy and perfect. People say, well, he doesn't really want us to be perfect. But I don't remember a seminary, seminary professor who said, yes, he does. We won't get there, but that's what he calls us to do. Be me perfect as I am perfect. But, you know, he calls us to be holy and perfect in 1 Peter 1, 16 and Matthew 5, 48. We are to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, according to Acts 1, 8. And to make disciples of all nations, according to Matthew 28, 19, and 20. God's response to Moses' concern was that the best, was the best news possible for Moses and us. Certainly, I will be with you. That's what God told him. That's all it is. Certainly, I will be with you. God's words to Moses and to us is that he, God, is in us, is what gives us the power to carry out his plans for us. It's not our power. We're not working under our power in any circumstances. It's God's power through us that allows us to do what he's calling us to do. And so and then as we uh, get, uh, look at verses 19, I mean, verses 13 through 15 uh, in chapter 3, it says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come into the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt thus say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So Moses offered God a second excuse. He was saying, here, Lord, uh, what am I going to say to the children of Israel? You know, instead of wondering what he would say to Pharaoh, now he says, what am I going to say to the children of Israel? Uh, Moses was concerned about uh, what, what, what they would think of him. Uh, these are his people, and they're God's people. But why would they trust Moses? As far as they were concerned, Moses really was not one of them. Moses had been a prince. He had been over there in the king, in the in the in, with the Pharaoh, he had brought, he had brought up in the, in the palace. So he really wasn't one of them. And so uh, they, they grew, he grew up in Egypt, but he never shared the burden of being under slavery. He was never a slave in Egypt. So he didn't have that in common with them. He also had been living apart from them for 40 years. They hadn't even known him for 40 years he'd been gone. Probably a lot of people even knew Moses uh, were dead, like, like, the, like the Pharaoh. Now, who was he supposed to say sent him? In verse 14, God responded to Moses' request for his name, said, I am that I am. God's response is not a name that makes God an object of a definition. He can't define it or give it limitations. It's an affirmation that God is always subject, always free to be, and act as God, as God wills. He can't be defined by any dictionary or comprehended by human philosophy. He is the omnipresent God. God made it easy for Moses when he Israelites demanded who he was. He said, just say, I am. I am has sent me. And you know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am, you know, in the New Testament, Jesus kept saying, I am, I am, I am. To say, I am God incarnate. That's who I am. And in verse 15, uh, connects the divine name from verse 14. That's the name in Hebrew is Yahweh. It just has four, four letters, uh, Y-H-W-H. And to the history, that was the name from the history of Israel. Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. So that would connect them to history. If they knew he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
Then Moses could say, well, this is your God. He's been the God of the children of Israel since Abraham. So this is your God that, that has sent me here. And so by referencing the history of Israel, God was reminding Moses and us that while his name and his nature are beyond our ability to fully comprehend, he has chosen to reveal himself to us. The one who had guided Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would now lead them out of bondage into a land of prosperity and freedom. God's faithfulness and self-sufficiency are guideposts to his people and steady foundations for living a life that is devoted to the kingdom of God. No matter what God has called you to do, you can be sure he has the grace, his grace is sufficient for you to accomplish it. <clears throat> and we know that God, uh, that Jesus, is God incarnate. We know that uh, he is everything that we need to know about God. Uh, just look at Jesus. Do you want to know what he, what's on the mind of God? Then look at Jesus. Do you want to know the will of God? Then look at Jesus. Do you want to know what is in the heart of God? Then look at Jesus. Jesus is the exact revelation of what is, what is on the mind, in the heart, and in the will of God. My Jesus is enduringly strong. He is entirely sincere. He is eternally steadfast. He is immortally gracious. He is imperially powerful. He is impartially merciful. He is great. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizons of the globe. He is God's Son. He's the sinner's Savior. He is the captive ransom. He's the breath of life. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of himself. He is august and he is unique. He is unparalleled and he is unprecedented.